Amen, amen, and amen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Adidaya Babala, and tonight we are going to be getting into um, a teaching that, you know, it's quite exciting in that, you know, it's one of those teachings that if you pay attention to, it's it's been a series for us, you know, and this is the Life of Honor Part 6B, meaning that we have had 12 teachings on the Life of Honor, every one of them really power-packed. I want to encourage you to get these teachings, you know, they are online and they will be a blessing to you. We have been looking at the Life of Honor, uh, you know, I, I'm going to start off this way that um, Honor is a fruit of the Spirit right honor is a fruit of the spirit and so if we're talking about the fruit of the spirit obviously we're talking about a character that's which you see because something is on the inside when we talk about fruit fruit is the um, physical evidence of something that is under the ground as it were right so the fruit of the spirit we said that um honor is a fruit of the spirit or is a constituent of the fruit of the spirit let's look at the fruit of the spirit let's look at galatians chapter 5 this is going to be a teaching that will bless you i'm sure where i'm going to you might not be able to guess at the moment but let you know let us get into it so swiftly look at galatians chapter 5 we would be reading from verse 22 it says but the fruit of the spirit is love the fruit of the spirit is love so the question the the the, the, the fact is if the if there is a fruit there must be a seed right the seed the life right the life is what is planted the seed amen and amen so when i got born again god planted his life into me i have the seed of god first john chapter 3 uh, from verse 9 tells us that we have the seed of god the greek word there is the word spama which is the word life where we get the word that you know for for a man you know spam it is the life right so we have the spam we we have the spam of god on the inside of us the life of god on the inside of us the seed of god on the inside of us and he having the seed of god on the inside of us we are to produce a fruit now that fruit is called love and in love is something called honor look at the fruit of the spirit the fruit of the spirit in verse 22 says but the fruit of the spirit is love inside of love you find joy now let me say something about the fruit of the spirit now the fruit the, the seed is what god gives to you the fruit is the manifestation your practical manifestation of the fruit of the seed that has been given to you right so what does god give to you the spirit then how do we use the spirit we use the spirit in practicing joy meaning everything that is called a fruit of the spirit or that is under the constituent of love there will be things you will have to intentionally practice i want you to write it down because you know a lot of times people think that the life in christ is something where with something just comes over you and then you start to act in a particular way like you are out of control even prophecy you know many years ago when i started learning the ropes of prophecy the way people practice prophecy i thought they were not in control i thought it was god that would take them over until you start to get into the word of god and you realize that the spirit you know the word of god the spirit of prophecy is so, the, the, the 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 prophet or the prophecy is subject to the prophet meaning that the prophet or the person speaking for by prophecy gives his permission to for words to come out of him hallelujah it shows that the, when it comes to the things of the spirit there must be a participation a fellowship a togetherness the spirit of god and you so when we are talking about the fruit of the spirit love as a character trait is that which will be practiced intentionally by you god will not pour something over you to make you feel lovely god will not pour something over you to make you feel joyful no joy love peace patience honor they are the fabrics of your spirit what do i mean they are already on the inside of you you now have to practice it uh, you know for example you know when my wife goes shopping she shops for bread she shops for apples they she now brings it into the house and then she would then say dio if you want to eat there is there are some apples by the shelf what i need to do right is to take 
go to the shelf take the apple and eat that will be me benefiting from that which he has done right so the gift of the spirit to us or the, the gift of god to us is the spirit if we see the beauties of the spirit we will cooperate with the spirit we will take a hold of what the spirit has done and what we're saying here look at verse 22 and, and i'm telling you i'm telling you from a point of view that it doesn't matter who you are or how you used to act before listening to me i'm telling you the word of god has the ability to change your life for example if you are listening to me and you have you have, you have issues with anger you have issues with unforgiveness so to speak you have issues with impatience and you are born again meaning that you have received the life of god the bible tells you that love is on the inside of you joy is on the inside of you look at joy for example you might be listening to me and you, you you're saying you have a bad day you look at the future it looks like you know what everything is terrible you have no particular reason to even smile but the bible actually says joy is on the inside of you so joy is not a function of what goes on around you joy is a function of who you are what god has done in you that is eternal that you can rejoice about so joy is the or rejoicing is the activity it is me choosing to stand up and laugh stand up and spin stand up and jump stand up and rejoice stand up and run around glory to god regardless of how i feel because i've got it on the inside of me it's the same thing here and that is, why do we renew our minds we renew our minds to get us to know what is inside of us that we may practice it hallelujah i'm saying all of this to say joy is on the inside of you peace is on the inside of you perseverance the staying power ability to stay in the midst of difficult situations and not complain and keep giving glory to god is on the inside of the believer oh how do i know the spirit of god says so the word of god says so. ability to stay ability to count it all joy in the midst of tough times a believer is not the one that backs down or the faith we have received is not with a faith where which when things get tough we now start to say oh my god oh my god where is god and then when things are good we start to say wow 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 no in the midst of tough times we stay counting it all joy even though we don't feel like it because the kingdom of god is above our feelings sometimes people say pastor i i, I want you to try to be sensitive now the, we, we 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 need to be auditive what do i mean by that we take the word as the final authority <laughs> glory to god and that is us renewing our minds and so we've said here that the gift of the fruit of the spirit is love and in love we have other constituents now look at the look at look at uh, the next verse look at verse 25 he says if we live in the spirit where are we at the moment in the spirit when i got born again my abode changed what is the abode where do i live now i live in the spirit the spirit is a position the spirit is what a position if we live in the spirit he now says look at it there let us also walk in the spirit so there is a walk there is that which we do Pastor Dyer, tell me, I really want to walk in the Spirit. Another way to say walking in the Spirit will mean to walk in the Word. That is why we read the Word of God. Let me tell you something. We don't read the Word of God to make God happy. We read the Word of God to know how to walk with Him. I will say it again. Whether you read the Word of God or you don't read the Word of God, God is never happy or sad. We read the word of God to know how to walk with God because knowledge is crucial to relationship with God. Think about it. Anyone you have a relationship with, you have a knowledge base about them. I practically can boast that I have a knowledge base about my wife more than anybody in the world. Why? Because I have a functional relationship and knowledge of our person. Amen and amen. And that's why we so we don't read the word of God to make God happy or to actually you know score a point with God. We read the word of God to know how to walk with God. I don't particularly particularly ask God show me the way to go the word of God is the vision of God when I get into the word of God I know the way to walk 
in the word is the walking ability of God. God has put his steps in the word of God for emphasis, even in the New Testament for the saints today. When I think I need to know what to do and I find myself in a situation where I don't know what to do, I get into the word. Why? God's word is God's steps. Hallelujah. In knowing his word is knowing his steps. Praise God. And as I feed myself with the word of God, hallelujah, some of those particular words come up on the inside of me, giving me direction. That's who the Christian is. Today, we are looking at the life of honor. And now we go to First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Amen and amen. Oh, that was a 10-minute introduction. Glory to God. First Peter chapter 2. Mm, glory to God. Look at it. If you look at verse chapter 1, you realize that Paul starts off just like Peter to tell the believer what God has done. Because the first thing you need to do before talking to people about how to live their lives is to tell them what God has done. First Peter chapter 1, look at verse 20, 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were redeemed. What is the first thing a believer should know? He should know what God has done. You have been redeemed not with corruptible things as silver or gold, things that can perish. From your vain conversations and the traditions that you have received from your fathers, but you have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without sport. Amen and amen. So he tells us there that we have been redeemed. If you get to verse 23, he tells us that we are born again. Look at that. That's Peter telling us who we are. Look at First Peter chapter 2 now. He starts to tell us how to walk. This is how it is. When you know who you are, then you know how to work. Hallelujah. When I forget how to walk, I remind myself of who I am. I use who I am, my identity, to correct my behavior. I'll say it again. You as a Christian are to use your identity in Christ to correct your behavior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at, and that's what you see Paul do with the people of with the current church. You realize the current church were a church where we they were fornicating regularly. First Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that it was commonly reported in verse 1 that they were fornicating in that church. And then Paul starts to rebuke the church with revelation. He says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That's revelation. He says, How will you take your body and then join it to the hallowed? Do you not know that the one that is joined to the hallowed is one with him? Just like the way a man is joined to the spirit and is one with God. You see, don't you know that your body is the members of Christ? So you see, Paul uses revelation to correct the behavior of the people hallelujah so when we know more it should imply that as we think through what we know more it affects our acts that's why after telling them about who they are in first peter chapter one in chapter two he starts to tell them what they are to do they are to lay aside malice now that you are born again you lay aside malice god hypocrisy envies and evil speaking how do you do it the same way the renewal but you he said as newborn babes desire the sincere make of the word that you grew there by if you want to know god's will read the word if you want to know god's direction read the word if you want to know what god will have you do read the word the word of god has revealed in Christ is God's final authority as it relates to your life. Glory to God. I had to say that because somebody needed to be blessed by it. Okay, let's go on now. Okay, first Peter, we're in chapter 2 and we're looking at the life of honor. And we are going to be, I'll be starting in a very strange dimension, talking about honor as it relates to relationships, particularly putting some, a little bit of emphasis on marriage, but I'll be coming from another point of view. Amen and amen. Look at first Peter, we are looking at uh, chapter 2 verse 21. It says, for even unto for even here unto where ye called because Christ also suffered for us look at it Christ suffered for us leaving us an example let me say something to you God gives us an example in how to act so we would know how to act because we look at what he has done hallelujah he says he has lived he has given us an example that we should follow his steps so we are not to follow our mood one we are not to follow how we feel two the believer follows the steps no so okay pastor Daya, i am not following the steps of jesus what do i do i renew my mind the more i renew my mind the more my mind is overwhelmed with his steps and the more i am more conscious of his steps if you realize that you are walking outside god's will renew your mind that your mind is filled with what his steps are and we start to look at the steps here look at it it says here verse 22 who did not sin neither was God found in his mouth 
who when he revealed he revealed not again when he suffered he threatened not and committed himself uh, to he committed himself to him that judges righteously who his own body bear our sins who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin might be alive to righteousness by whose stripes we're healed this verse is trying to say jesus suffered that we would have life follow it jesus suffered that we will have life look at verse 25 for you we are sheep going astray but now i return to the shepherd the pastor or and the overseer of your soul that's the word bishop there right so he's trying to say jesus suffered so that you will have life i'll say it again jesus suffered and so you will have life then he says jesus did that not just to give you life but also to show you as an example of how to live and now then we talk about marriage then he goes into first peter chapter 3 that's why he starts with likewise likewise what likewise how jesus suffered amen so he's trying why did he tell us about the suffering of christ he is trying to preach about marriage right when you find yourself in very difficult situations maritally he tells you exactly what to do let me let me, let me start off here you know people always say things like i don't want to get controversial but you know people always say things like um what god has joined together let no man put asunder trying to say that you know god is against i don't want to sound controversial but i want you to hear what i'm trying to say like god is against divorce and god will never allow a person divorce that's the way they interpreted it but you know if we have some time we're going to look at what god joins together is it a man and a man a man and a woman that god joined together that god is saying no one should put asunder is god saying or oh, no because why am i sharing this you need to understand this because a lot of people i'm saying this interestingly a lot of people have died in abusive marriages because they have been wrongly taught that they are to stay in places where which they their lives are in jeopardy pastor die what are you trying to say listen i am married i'm happily married i don't have plans to divorce anytime soon if my wife divorced me i'll follow her you know so forget about it. i'm not trying to endorse divorce i am just trying to say when we don't understand scriptures well it makes it look like um, god is saying something he never said and then people get into trouble they are they are they are ground let me say this they are okay why are you even talking to us about divorce a, a believer must know the truth of where god what god is saying part time and what god is not saying let me say this what does god want you to do god wants you to behold what he has joined together what did god join together god joined christ and the church what did god join together christ and the church what does god want you to do copy in your physical marriage what has happened in christ and the church now the issue is this would there be situations and circumstances because where which individuals on the earth are acting in ways that the life of the other spouse is in danger yes what does God say people should do? There are grounds for these things. Right? And that's why, for example, I am not trying to advocate the divorce, but I am not going to actually pastor somebody who ends up dying in the home based on what God did not say. Are you getting my point? I, you see, I am for love. I am for relationship. I am for a marriage. I believe so strongly that individuals, like I was soon preach, individuals, when they go into marriage, they are making one of the greatest decisions of their lives. They should take their time. They should know the person. They should pray about it. They should seek uh, the, 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 the um, counsel from their spiritual leaders. They should talk to their parents. It's one of the major decisions that will affect everything about your life, you know, as it were you do it and when that you do it there is a way that we are to walk in it there is a step to follow however i am also saying before i get into the steps to follow that there are sometimes for some reason or the other strange situations happen and jesus tells us that strange situations happen when strange situations happen and a, the life of a person is in danger or when a person doesn't want to live with you god says you are not in bondage you can leave let me show you that first before i get into the steps Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 7. Say, Pastor Dai, oh my God, you know, you say many, many things. I never knew a time would come you endorse divorce. I'm not endorsing divorce. I'm just saying to you that let us take that one away. What did Christ join? Christ did not join a man and a woman. No. Christ joined, God joined, God did not join a man and a woman. God joined Christ and the church. God now says, this joining that I have joined, I want you to give an example of it in your marriage. Hallelujah. Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 
Amen and amen and amen. Look at, look at, look at, look at um, 1 Corinthians 7. Look at verse 12. It says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she, so they are married, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So if you if you if both of you get married before you met the Lord, and then you meet the Lord, and you are a man, and your wife is not born again, are you to pursue the lady if she loves you and wants to stay with you? The Bible says, keep her sanity. Look at the next one because there's some people that say, you know, I just got born again. I should not be unequally looked. No, it's too late. You are already married to this one. Hallelujah. Why am I pastor that it doesn't affect us? I must say these things because somebody must have it said. Look at verse 14. It says, for the unbeliever. Okay. Okay, look at verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not. And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So I'm a woman, I get born again. My husband is not born again. Should I make life difficult for him? No, we're going to even look at it. He says, if he loves you and wants to stay with you, let him stay. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified. What is the word there, sanctified? What does that mean? It doesn't mean the person is saved. It means the person will have a first and privilege of seeing the life of God manifested in front of him by his wife. That's the word. The man there, the, he says for the, 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 he says the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, meaning the wife. The wife is not saying that the wife will pour holy water on him. No, it means the wife will act in ways where which he will see the life of God practically. So if you are born again and you are living with someone that is not born again and the person is pleased to live with you, you become the message they listen to. You be Your life becomes the message that they listen to. You see, the truth about it is, you know, they will, sometimes they particularly, it's not from the blasting of the message when they are passing by or the funny prayer points as it were. I love prayer. I'm saying you should pray. Believers should pray. But I'm saying much more. God is saying if you are at home with somebody that is not born again, it is your conduct that will make them actually see that something has happened. They are open to you and then you can preach the gospel to them. You see, when I, I, I was not born again at some point, then I got born again. You know, and when I got born again, drastically, a couple of my actions and activities changed and the people around me started to ask questions. Okay, what is this about i see that you care i see that you reach out i see that you give i see that you're tolerant what's happening to you voila that's what we're talking about it's not see so conduct is crucial if you're in a place where with people do not believe i'll say it again where people don't believe conduct is crucial what does conduct do conduct is not particularly the message but conduct opens them up to the message when we behave in funny ways we cannot reach people because we have become a hindrance to the message we want to preach that's why paul will say to the jews i became like the jews amen and amen hey you know but still under christ bro glory to god amen and amen so he said so what does conduct do don't get me wrong that pastor i said we should not pray the gospel all we should just do is that we should just be saying hello and hi no i am saying to you that conduct opens the door for them to see that something is different amen and amen so let's continue here we are in i hope someone is being blessed by this first corinthians chapter 7 look at it now it says in verse 14 where it says and the unbelieving wife is sanctified same thing when the, that means that woman will have the privilege to see the god life practice in her home a man walking in the fruit of the spirit love patience kindness then she has the privilege to see it firsthand and he says he says look at it there he says uh, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband else were your children unclean but now they are clean now they are holy meaning they are set apart they have a woman who has met with god who by a meeting with god can influence those children they are set apart they are not like everybody amen and amen why because they have a godly influence at home so when you are born again who are you to your husband if he's not born again a godly influence who are you to your children a godly influence praise the lord okay 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 let's continue here uh i, I think i missed out the part mm, 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 mm. Mm, 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 okay let's continue it says it says now in verse 15 but if the unbelieving so if this person that you are married to decides to say i don't this own believer thing you're doing i don't understand it he says if the unbelieving depart let him depart city let him depart is this a divorce yes let him depart why he wants to depart hallelujah he wants so 
particularly you don't beg people to stay <laughs> amen in marriage is a commitment but if the unbelieving depart the unbelieving meaning after he has seen what you have believed he doesn't want to come along with you on this journey or he does he says you know what i'm not a part of it he said let him depart a brother or a sister is not under bondage in cases such as these so they are what we call cases such as these and the things we call cases such as these are things where which the will of another person is involved one and your life is at stake two amen and amen what am i say, doing here i am teaching in a way you might never have heard being taught in the church before but it's bringing sanity to your mind on what grounds can we look at divorce and say well yeah and god is happy with it number one when the other person is no longer interested one and number two when your life is involved that death is on the way what the bible says in cases such as this the man is not in bondage neither is the woman for god has called us to peace look at it again god has called us to peace what am i saying here I'm saying before I even get into conduct, I am saying that by the time you hear what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes, you know, don't say, you know what, well, wow, it means that, man, when I get married, when I get married, even if I'm about to lose my life and person, someone is behaving anyhow and the person really doesn't want me, I really, really, really to, to stay. God said, God has not called you into bondage in these cases. Marriage is for two people who have a commitment and they find that commitment in their Lord Jesus Christ, in how he's committed to them. He shows it in his death and his resurrection. He is committed to them. He will never leave them. On those grounds, they go into marriage to try to replicate that life. But if one of them decides and says, I don't want to be with you again, God has not called you into bondage. I have a lot, I know a lot of people who are for one reason or the other, a husband or wife has left them and even the church has made them feel like a second class citizen. No, there are some times where which divorce was the savior. You know, some people say, Pastor Dio, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this in, in a church. I am telling you, and that is why churches, ministers, you must listen to me carefully, right? We must not categorize people based on their marital status. <laughs> Hallelujah. From a point of view, people are the same in the local church. They are the same in the local church. They are bought for by the blood of Christ. They are new men in Christ. You know, Christ died for them, but some people are in situations that we call such cases right in such cases you know we understand and then we move on amen and amen the other things to talk about in this regards but i wanted to just touch on this i'll say it again what did god join together god joined together christ and the church god did not join together a man and a woman what does a man and a woman do a man and a woman together make a decision that they want to be joined and in that joining god ratifies it in that god says okay i agree then god says replicate what you see me do in christ and the church praise god hallelujah praise god okay pastor Dio, i don't think you have read genesis if you have read genesis you will never talk like this remember that the book of genesis should i say this okay let me say it. remember that the book of genesis was a book talking about jesus it was a book talking about redemption. It was a book talking about the life in Christ. So when you are reading Genesis, you know, I'm not going through very steep flaws. When you are reading Genesis, please remember that this book talks of Christ. Luke 24 tells us, let me show you. Luke 24. Luke 24. Go there. Luke 24. Hey, verse 44. It says, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses. Are you seeing it now? Genesis, right? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, which are written in the prophets, which are written in the Psalms concerning me. So the, the, the book of Moses is about Jesus hallelujah look at john chapter 5 john chapter 5 quickly the book you see i'm going somewhere i've not even gotten near john chapter 5 the book you see and that's why that book is called a mystery john chapter 5 look at john chapter 5 we are going to be reading verse 46 it says for had ye believed moses you would have believed me for he wrote of me john 5 46 who, who, so when you're reading genesis exodus leviticus numbers what you have in the back of your mind he's talking about jesus look in a mystery in a hidden form say some pastor Daya, i really don't get what you're talking about now you get it look at verse 47 <laughs> when you don't get what pastor Daya is saying let me tell you what to say lift your hand your hands to god say ha 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 i'll get it <laughs> he said ha ha i'll get it for i've got what it takes to get it look at verse 47 
But if ye believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Meaning the writings of Moses and the words of Jesus are the same. Hallelujah. So let's go into the writings of Moses. Genesis chapter 2. You know, I didn't even intend to go here, but since we are here, let's go there anyway. Genesis chapter 2. That interesting place where God speaks about joining of the flesh. Look at verse 21. John Genesis 2 21. Put it in your mind. Who is God talking about now? God is talking about the st- Jesus, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the implication of the of the life of Jesus. That's what he's talking about in Genesis. Many, many stories, but the hidden clues are there. So look at verse 21. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. What is that? It's just simply, you know. Hmm. That statement there is a prophetic statement to tell you that Christ will die. Deep sleep. So what happened? Christ dies. That's what he's saying there. He fo- deep sleep falls on Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. Christ will die deep sleep. When Christ dies, what will happen? And he slept and he took out one of the ribs. Notice. He took out, so God will do a walk on Jesus. Jesus will die, right? Look at it. And he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh instead of, you know, I've heard it before. I'm not sure if I've preached it before, but I'm sure you know people have said that this lady I married, that's my rib. That lady is not your rib. She's a human being, yeah? She's not your rib. She can't be your rib. This rib that he's talking about here is talking about Christ and the church. Amen. Follow me. He's talking about Christ and the church. Who is the woman that you have married? That's the person you have made a decision to be one with. Copying the story of Christ and the church. Amen. Amen. Who did God join together? Christ and the church. Who died? Christ. Amen. And amen. Look at it. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her unto him. So what happened? Who is the woman? The woman is the church. Amen. The woman is the church. Christ is the Adam that sleeps. Christ's death and his resurrection bets the church. Matthew 16 tells you, right? And I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When did that happen? When he came out of the grave, when he died and he resurrected, the church was born. So Adam dies, Adam sleeps, deep sleep. You get the clue? Deep sleep is to get you to notice that Adam is, Moses is now saying, I'm talking about something deeper than I went to bed. Deep sleep, Adam, um, Christ dies, in the way resurrection of christ something is born what did he call that thing he called the thing a woman <laughs> amen amen and amen look at it and the rib with the lord god had taken from man made he a woman and he brought her unto the man and adam said this is now follow this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man who why is she called woman she was taken out of man who was taken out of christ the church remember bone of my bone the bible says here that this is not talking about adam and eve particularly is talking about christ and the church go to the book of ephesians ephesians chapter 5 say pastor what are we doing today we're doing a bible study amen and amen you know this book one of the things about the Bible is the more you think you know, the more you realize that there is more to know. Selah. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 30. Look at verse 30. It says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Who is he talking about here? Who is he talking about here? He's talking about Christ and his church. Who are the members of his body and the bones? He's talking about Christ and the church. If you read from above, you know that he's talking about Christ and the church. Look at it here. It says in verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Who is the one flesh? Christ and the church. Look at what he says here. He says this is a great mystery. So Paul is trying to explain what you saw in Genesis. As a story, he's trying to tell you what we're talking about there is Christ and the church. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what is the idea? Christ sleeps, he wakes, he resurrects, the church is born, 
the church, Christ and the church are now one. In their oneness, who did the work? Christ. And then two people who are born again Christians decide to become one. When do they become one? When does marriage take place? When father gives, uh, when parents from one side give uh, a daughter to a man. That's the first part of them being one. But the Bible tells us that they become one when sexual relationship takes place. Oneness happens when sex takes place between a man and a woman. So the oneness that they become one is when they actually have that sex. So for example, even if one person gives another person to another person and there is no sexual union, they are not one. Hallelujah. Yet. Amen and amen. Because the Bible tells us that when they have that sex, that they now become one flesh. Let me show you 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Say, Pastor Dio, hey, all these things that you are sharing with us, when you, you just need to know these truths. Amen and amen. First Corinthians 6, 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith it shall become one. When you become one, when you are joined to another sexually, that's what he's talking about here. Look at verse 17. That says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. So, how do you become one spirit with God? You believe on the gospel. Amen. How did you become one with your spouse? You slept with the with, with her. Praise the Lord. So now let's go back. I have said all these many beautiful things to say that Christ and the church is the example for all of us. I'm saying as well, in the midst of all of this, there will be some times and situations where which, though we are Christians, or though there is one person that is a Christian, the other person is not interested and is making life a living hell. The Bible says the other person in such cases, you know, can decide to allow the other person go. That person is not in bondage. Now we are not going to go into 1 Peter chapter 3. Pastor Dai, why did you do it that way? When I say what I'm about to say now, if I didn't say what I've said before, you would think, man... God is not really fair. 1 Peter 3 verse 1. 1 Peter 3 verse 1. There are steps we follow in marriage. Look at it. now says likewise ye wives. Why did he say likewise ye wives? Because he has told you that there is a step to follow. What is the step? A sacrificial lifestyle. No, you know when you see in 1 Peter 3 verse 1. Likewise ye wives. You know you can put likewise ye husbands there too. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You can put likewise ye husbands there too. Like, because what he's teaching is not for women only. What is teaching here is the conduct we have in marriage when we are with a spouse that is particularly difficult. Amen and amen. So you can put likewise ye. Because it's not only the woman that should act right in marriage. No, Christianity is not chauvinism. Right? Christianity is also not feminism. Christianity is the life of God at work in us. First Peter, First Peter chapter 3. You must never have a wife or a husband that is walking on eggshells because you are there. And then you enjoy the awesome privilege of worshipping with your father. No! It's wrong! Repent! You're a new creation! Hallelujah! Give people time to grow! Amen! Give them time! Even in marriage! Yes! That's what you do! Why? God gave you time to grow! I look at my life 15 years ago, I look at my life now, I'm, I always just say, wow, what a patient God! Glory to God. I remember when I used to preach and the things I used to say 16 years ago. And I'm, what I'm saying now, God must have had to have looked at the fact that something good will come out of this boy. That's why he didn't shut me up 16 years ago. Amen and amen. Praise God. Was I healing the sick back then? Yes. Casting out devils? Yes. Had people come out from the dead? Yes. But was I saying a couple of nonsense here and there? Yes. But what, what was God? Patient. What do I do? I use that patience with my spouse. Hallelujah. You know when you celebrate your spouse, you know people think it's because people are perfect. When your spouse celebrates, it's not because they are perfect. It's because you look past their imperfections and see Christ in them and celebrate the good things that people do patiently walking with them. You know you must learn that thing called patience. You must. Never make people feel uncomfortable because you know better. It shows you don't know well as you ought to do. Never make people feel uncomfortable. Let it be that through you, others learned and they grew and they did not feel stupid around you. You can do it. First Peter chapter 3. Likewise. You keep correcting. That's how the word of God is. You know, you didn't read the Bible once and they took it from you. The word of God is ever correcting, rebuking, reproving. And God never comes when you're reading the Bible and say, I'm tired. 
<laughs> Look at verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, put it the same pastor that you say you can put us bands there. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your whole husbands. Okay, let's get into it now. Be in what subjection? So, what is the character that you follow in Christ? What is the character that you follow in Christ as a woman? It's submission. What is submission really? Submission is actually intentionally, write it down. It is intentionally, intentionally following ways set above and ahead of you. I'll say it again. Submission is you in when we say we are submitted to Christ, it means that we are intentionally following his ways. When we say we are submitted to a local church and a pastor, is where we are intentionally following his ways in Christ. So submission in marriage will be intentionally following, not wanting to always have your way. Look at it there. Be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word. Listen, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wife. It means, though it's not promising that you would the person would be one there it's just saying something that you never sometimes think about your conduct in the front of your spouse matters i'll say it again as a man or a woman you you, say, you, you know the person is your lover your this your dad but your conduct matters in front of this person that it matters hallelujah so Man, hear me. Woman, hear me. If you're married, a conduct that is exemplary, a conduct, it matters. People will not always be of their best behavior. What do you owe people when they are not of their best behavior? A better way to do it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, listen, you are not following any other person's steps but the steps of Jesus. So, Pastor, you know, you don't understand new age. You don't understand uh, what, what are you trying to say here? No, there is a way we are. Because you know, we in Christ, we don't marry because we just want to marry. We marry to bring glory to God. Hallelujah. In that marriage. Yeah, look at it. Look at it there. It says that if they obey not the word. So your conduct is important. Meaning that the word of God practiced through you is what people see. I mean, your husband. I mean your wife is what they see they might be you know your husband might not be able to sit down right and quote john 3 verse 16 or quote the fruit of the spirits but if one day you ever hear someone talking about the fruit of the spirit and they're explaining long suffering or perseverance you should say wow oh this is what matthias has been practicing with me hmm okay Likewise, he wise being subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won. But I am saying this again. Your conduct is important. Your conduct is important. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. While they behold. Someone, someone says, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. No, you should care. <laughs> you should care. And in that you care, you act rightly. Look at it there. While they behold. God is telling you that your spouse looks at you. Even if your spouse stays, I don't look at you. Even when your spouse says, I don't care, they care. <laughs> I'm telling you. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with reverence. You know, you know, you know, there is nothing wrong. It's Christocentric to be respectful. Let me tell you something I learned that I, I, I am walking towards. Never ever take for granted those who are near, who you are valued if they were far. I am speaking about in your marriage. Don't take them for granted. You don't have to. You you no, you don't have to. Don't make a person realize or make it look like the decision, the worst decision they made was that they came into your life because you will have respected them more if they were not there. While they behold, they look at it. They look at it. They behold your conversation coupled with reverence this one is under authority there is a lord over this one's life and is our lord jesus and she's following his steps is it going to be pastor Dio? be real is it going to be comfortable sometimes it's not comfortable sometimes love is not comfortable there is sacrifice pains jesus christ was not particularly laughing like he was at a you know like at a comedy show on the cross it was painful so sometimes there will be sacrifice but we go with it amen amen we do we do we do we do we do Glory to God. He says, you know, says, you know, this is peculiarly for the ladies. He says in verse 3, whose adorning 
He says, Christian ladies, the beauty, God did not say, did not say don't be beautiful. God says in the priority, it is first your conduct. That is, when we say a woman in Christ is beautiful, Peter is renewing our minds. We are not talking about the cause. We are not talking about the face that doesn't have pimples. We are not talking about the legs that is fresh, that has been pampered, pancaked with sheer butter, and all these nude makeup kits. That's not the first thing we are talking about when we say a woman is beautiful in Christ. The world might look at it and say, oh my God, the, the leg is this way, the upper region is this way, the bum is that way. But for the saint, he says we look differently. Notice it here. Look at what he says. He says, who's adorning? Let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair, wearing of gold, or putting on of clothes. Notice here. He didn't say, don't wear clothes, or don't wear gold, or don't plate your hair. He's saying the emphasis where the lady puts her emphasis in her walk with, in her life is first growing in Christ. So she beautifies her mind before beautifying her body. I'll say it again. The new man in Christ, the woman, just like the man, the emphasis for the man. When we say a woman is beautiful, we are in, in terms of the Christ life. We are talking about the fact that she has renewed her mind. We are seeing the fruit of the spirit emerging from this person. That is beautiful. That is uh, beautiful. This one is beautiful. We did not say nothing, you know, because people always hear Pastor Daya sometimes in a funny way. Pastor Daya just said, ah, I should not do makeup. And you come around looking like a scarecrow. You don't have to. No. You can be beautiful. But we are saying that, you, you know, you can be balanced. I love balance. Enjoy and embrace balance. Like, do you know you can give time to studying God's word? Renewing your mind? And it's affecting your relationship and your conduct out there? And then when it's time to go out, you step out in a nice suit. Or step out in a knickerbocker. Anyone that makes you look beautiful. And you go out. You, you don't have to be lopsided. You know some people, it's only they know the best clothes out there. They know the best shoes. They know when Gucci is doing sales. But they have no thing with the word. And some other people, while they actually act spiritual, they act like they are not human beings. Brothers and sisters, you are Christians, you can be balanced. You can be where which you will know God's word. You will know what to do. You will know what to do. You will know how to practice the things of the spirit. Yeah. And you do that by learning the word. Sit with the word. The Bible says study to show yourself approved. Sit with messages. Confess God's word. Beautify your inside. And come out, glory to God. He says, this is the way women ought to make themselves beautiful in the days of old. Look at it there. Let it not be the adorning. And you know, I've said this is for men and women. For men. And you know, people always say things like, uh, pray for your future husband. And you know, you, you really never hear men talk about pray for your future wife. And you know, because we always make it look like the women have to be the one that is responsible. No. As a man, you're, mad, you're a man that is working in the world renewing your mind knowing god's will and god's plan giving time to pray in the spirit amen and amen embracing and enjoying times of fasting there is nothing wrong there glory to god amen and amen glory to god look at it he says but let it be verse 4 let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit which is in the listen for those who love the lord Amen. What pleases God, which is in the sight of God, a great price of great value. What is of great value in the eyes of God? A man with a renewed heart. What does the Bible say about this in the book of Timothy? His meat unto every good work. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen and amen. He says in verse 5, after this manner, in the, in the time of old, the holy women, we trusted in God adorn themselves so in the time of old when they say that sarah was beautiful what did they really mean in genesis that she was a beautiful woman say pastor are you saying that sarah was not fine i need uh, I, uh, I name my daughter sarah because they said sarah in the bible was very fine she was a fair woman are you coming out there sarah, sarah is not fine what, what, what are we what are we telling you we are telling you that first the beauty of sarah is first in the fact that she was someone who followed god's word that's the beauty of sarah right there that's what the epistles tell us. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Okay. 
Ah, but I know Sarah that is beautiful. Glory to God. Amen and amen. Oh, in and out, I should say. All right, amen and amen. It says in verse 5, For this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God had done themselves, being subject unto their own husbands, even as Sarah. Hallelujah. Sarah did what? Sarah obeyed her husband, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Right? You see, what did he say? What did Sarah do? Sarah was one who renewed her mind in our context today. That's Sarah for you there. Amen and amen. Giving attention to the word in that it now affects how she acted in her marriage. In that, you know, she did she was. What does it mean? It just means practicing the fruit of the spirit in your marriage. Hallelujah. Putting God first. Putting love first. What will God do in this situation? Hallelujah. The litmus test, the common sense in your marriage is love. Hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. Look at verse 7. I'm about to round up now, but this way I've been going to since morning. Likewise, ye husbands. You know, we're talking about honor. Honor in marriage. Honor your spouse look at verse 7 what does honor mean honor means to treat as valuable and sacred all right so look at verse 7 likewise your husbands dwell with them dwell with your wife according to gnosis knowledge be intelligent that's the word there know the woman know the word and practice the knowledge of the word with the bounds of knowing the woman amen and amen and amen value respect the person amen you know you know you don't lose your manliness being respectful and kind you know sometimes i always tell people that some a lot of decisions in the home i don't make them i don't make them because you see you can all, not always be right all the time if you're if you're if you're right all the time then it means you married an idiot you can't be right all the time hallelujah there are things that you just know them there are things that your spouse will be better at doing why 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 do you feel less of a man because she, you know, if you allow her to do it, it means that maybe you're not. No. Hallelujah. Imagine me picking holiday destinations. I'll most likely pick maybe, maybe, I'll just say we should go to Afghanistan or something. No, you know, I mean, my, maybe, you know, no, you, you allow people, you, you dwell with who you're, you're with in knowledge. In the knowledge of God's word. Amen and amen. With the person that you're with. With marriage, while there is a head, it's a partnership. Two people working together, you're not competitors. You're not trying to outsmart the other person. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Glory to God. In marriage, don't practice covetousness. It's all about money, 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 money. You know, being shady about those things, hiding your money and all of those things. No. No, you don't need to. I'm talking to the two of you. And I'm sure if, if you are, they are hiding money from you, so I'm sure they've noticed something about your character too. So I'm saying, you, you, you got to be someone who actually... Price it. You see, the more you price God as big in your life, the more money loses its value in terms of how you live for money. Amen and amen. Look at it. Let's continue so that we can round up today. Likewise, he says, dwell with them in knowledge. Giving honor. You see, let me say something. If people cannot say, ah, this uncle loves his wife because of how they view you consciously or unconsciously. Or if your wife cannot say, ha, my husband loves me. Something's wrong. Scripturally. Giving what? Oh no, give me what? Oh, mark it in your Bible. Your wife is someone you value. Value. I mean, she must be comfortable in the fact that she knows that you value her. You are, you are a Christian. Hallelujah. Praise God. Value. You treat her special. Amen. You know, this thing is also for, for women. You know, you know sometimes... The beauty of spirituality is what the word of God says. Don't neglect your wife. That's what I'm saying. Listen to what she's saying. Value. You know, <laughs> I had to learn these things and I'm still learning it. You know, because I've been a pastor from when I was in university. And so, you know, like I always say, when I get when I got married, I had to start to think for more than one person. Right? Putting while you're thinking and making your evaluations, you're thinking about the implication of your actions on the other person. Value. Amen. Because you see, you can't say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. And you are treating your wife in dishonor. The Bible will therefore call you a hypocrite. You know something? Practice God's word. Do something this season that makes your wife say, Wow. For me? You, you will not die. Oh. 
I can assure you I've been there, I've come back. I'm still alive. You will not die. I am telling you, you treat your wife with value. People should look outside and say, wow. And they say, why do you do this? He says, Christ and the church. Christ died for the church. I'm not done. I'm, what have I done? What, what have I done that you're saying, wow, wow, wow? Where I'm coming from? The person I'm looking at, he died. I mean, he died for the church. That's how much he valued the church. So what have I done? What did I do that? I, what is, you know? That's the mindset of a Christian that is following God's word. Honor, value, esteem. Your wife is not meant to have insecurity issues or lack of assurance issues around you. You know, anytime I stand up in front of someone that is sick, I am never thinking, oh God, don't embarrass me. I am so assured. I even feel that he's more involved than I am. Assurance. I am in touch with my spouse as it relates to Christ and the church. I mean, I am so assured of Christ never leaving me that, that when I am ministering, I am never scared. Assurance. I am not going about looking around and saying, where are you? Where are you going to turn up from? I know he's there. He values me that much. He's there. Amen and amen. And that's what we know and we now use in Christ. This is important. It's very, very important. It's not about couple goals. Though. It's about the goal Christ scored. <laughs> Glory to God. It's about the goal he scored in his resurrection. Mother Susa says. That's, what, that's why. That is actually why. It's not because we are trying to do it so that everybody will say wow. It's about the fact that this is our life. You honor the lady. Hallelujah. Look at it. It's Bible. Bible. You know you can call your wife after this meeting and say, Do you feel honored? Do you feel honored? It's a pastor, pastor, that you don't put us in trouble. We didn't plan for this. We just only came for Bible study. <laughs> How can, can we call? She can't say, forget it. You know, because you need to be doing the word. Look at it there. It says, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Treat her as precious. They didn't say she's weak out. You know, there are some people you will marry. You can't even say your wife is the weaker vessel. Seller, you know, yeah. You know, with the days that people are doing all this muscle gymming and all of those kind of things, you can't call your wife weaker vessel. She punch you, you just sleep. You know, so you can't even call her weaker vessel. That's part of it. So it's as meaning, you know, the way, you know, when you pick egg, you know, but we know we treat egg because when egg falls, it's, it breaks, right? Yeah. So we treat them with that level of value and honor. We, you know, your wife should not be crying and it doesn't mean anything to you. Ah, uh -uh. no, no, no. Amen and amen. Look at it there. Look at it there. Let's let's conclude tonight. Giving honor unto the wife as unto a weaker vessel and being heirs. Why am I so? Why do I treat my wife this way? Did, did, why do I value her this much? It's because she values me first. No. It's because she's nice to me. No. It's because she's beautiful. No. It's because she's a brother or she's a sister to you. The reason why we treat our spouse well is not their conduct but who their father is and who they are to you. You know the first thing, the first connection you have to your spouse is that she, your spouse is brethren. I'll say it again. Your spouse is bre, brethren. You are born of the same father. In the resurrection you became family. Hallelujah. So you must see your wife as a family member of the household of God. A family member that you are, your, your father is God. You are both joint heirs. That's why she's valuable to you. Not because of any other thing. It's because, so resurrection is the reason for the value in my marriage. In your marriage too. Why do I value my wife? The resurrection. Why? We are joint heirs. So from the market pool of all ladies that are joint heirs with me, I picked one to be one with. And then in that oneness, I value her not because she's beautiful, she's nice. I value her because we are joint heirs in Christ. So the resurrection is the fuel and the catalyst of your marriage. Amen. Look at it again so we can conclude tonight. As unto a weak vessel has been heirs to get up the grace of life, that your prayers be not. And you know, a lot of people have threatened men with this. Let me bring clarity to it. You know, people say things like, if you fight with your wife, God will not answer your prayer. No, that's the, the forgive KJV. That's not what it is saying there. You know, the Bible already tells you in 1 John chapter 5 that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence. When you ask anything in the, in the name of the Lord, He hears you. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So God cannot now say, ah, you're not, you're not talking to your wife. 
You know that <laughs> I'm not answering your prayer. God, no, no. What happens? Number one, when you're living in bitterness and offense, your heart is blocked in picking from God. And number two, when it says you will, it means two of you together will not be able to pray together. That's what he's trying to say in the two contexts. So he's not saying that, okay, for example, now because you're fighting with your wife, you are praying. God just says, I am not talking to you. Dio, I am not talking to you. Until you go and talk to your wife, I'm not talking to you. That makes God a conditional God. Right? When that happens, number one, is an issue. The issue is your heart can't pick it. Because faith and love was not together. Your heart will not be able to do the best that it ought to do. And number two, two of you cannot pray together now because there's offense in there. Right? So what have we learned today? Very shortly, very briefly. There ought to be a symbiotic relationship of honor in your marriage. Practice what I have taught you tonight. Talk to that brother. Talk to that sister. Whoever it is that you are married to. Amen. And, so and then actually ensure that there is a there is an intentional effort to walk in love. I mean honor in that marriage. Amen. When we put these things first, a lot of things will take shape. A lot of things. And we'll be doing the will of God. We'll be following the steps of God just in the way that the Lord honors us. I hope you have learned from this today. I hope you have, you know, I, you know, you, you were blessed by this. Someone might be saying, well, you know what, to be honest, I am not particularly married. So what did I get from that? <laughs> you need to know these things now. So you don't go and get shocked in marriage. Amen and amen. I believe Christians, if they had known this earlier, you know, not in marriage, they'll do better in their marriages. So I commend you to God tonight. I hope you have been blessed by this phenomenal teaching on honor. Just a part of it. Just a very, very, very little part of it. You know, we continue in our next week's teaching on next Sunday in a more robust one. God bless us richly. And it's from Pastor Dyer again saying, get somebody to teach the truth of God's word too. And together, amen and amen, we took Europe for Christ. God bless you. Amen. Good night. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah.